الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Before looking at the topic of this evening, first things first, I feel that it is first for me to welcome you all this evening and as a welcome to myself, uh, back to Sri Lanka after many years. It is uh, a great pleasure for me to be back here again. Uh, Alhamdulillah, some years back I even thought of moving to Sri Lanka. <laughs> you know, when I left Saudi Arabia, I had a visa for Sri Lanka thinking maybe I might come and live here. But Allah had me go to the United Arab Emirates instead. Anyway, the point is that I do uh, think in the past of the fond memories I have of Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan people, uh, especially, of course, my Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, who have been very welcoming in the past, and who, and amongst whom I see a great uh, thirst and desire for knowledge of Islam, to be able to apply that knowledge within their own lives, and to share that knowledge with the community in which they live and to share it peacefully, alhamdulillah. Uh, having said that, the topic of the evening, first things first, really is another way of saying, put the horse before the cart. Don't put the cart before the horse. This is an old saying. The modern version, first things first was coined by uh, Stephen Covey in his famous book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a catchy phrase. And it's a good reminder for us because really as Muslims, this concept of first things first is deeply embedded in our religion. But before understanding its relevance, and why I chose it as the topic this evening, it fits within an overall uh, umbrella topic, which is planning, whether a Muslim should plan his or her life, or whether they shouldn't. Because, we have some people who feel that Muslims shouldn't plan. They should take things as they come. While others feel, no, we should plan. Those who say we shouldn't plan, say so because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of this universe, He describes Himself as being the planner. يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ He plans the affairs of the heavens and the earth. So for us to take on this quality and say we are going to be planning, this is not appropriate. We should instead just go with the flow. Whatever Allah has planned for us, we just accept it. This is Qadr, and we adjust ourselves to it. This is the thought of a segment among Muslims. However, most of us in our practical lives know from experience that planning is essential. Even to the level of going to the grocery store, or the supermarket, 
If we don't go there with a list, meaning we sat down, we planned out what we were going to buy, we'll go there and spend hours in the supermarket. There's so many different things to look at and you might pick a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you come home and you say, ah, I didn't get the things that I really needed to get there. This is what happens, this is what will happen. We know that. So, we plan things out. Similarly, when we set up businesses, if we just did set up our business in an ad hoc way, just, you know, get a few friends together, let's set up a business, anyhow, we'll just put some money in the bank or whatever and we'll just do it. And we don't do it like that. We sit and think out, what kind of business do we want? And what are we going to need to get to achieve that goal? We plan. And when we build bridges, if we didn't plan out the bridge, you know, we didn't have an engineer plan things out. We just brought cement and iron and everything to the bank of the river and we just started sticking things together as we went along. What kind of bridge would we end up with? So, all around us, in practical life, we see the necessity for planning. Which is why the famous saying amongst the people who are engaged in the field of management, they say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. This is the consequence. From research, they've shown that in a planning environment, 20% of the effort will produce 80% of the results. But in a non-planning environment, just take things as they come, 80% of the efforts will only produce 20% of the results. So, practically speaking, it seems like we should be planning. But the other argument that I mentioned, that of Allah being the planner, could cause us to stop for a minute and question, should we really be doing all that planning? However, the big question that comes is how do we determine or how do we judge? How do we choose whether to plan or not to plan when we have issues like this? We take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. As Allah said, if you have disagreements about anything, then take it back to Allah and His Messenger. This is the way to determine finally whether we should be planning or whether we shouldn't be. So the big question is, did Prophet Muhammad ﷺ plan? Was he a planner? Or did he just go with the events of his life as it came, whatever Allah, you know, decided for him, he just accepted. However, when we look into his life, what we see is meticulous planning. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu planned meticulously, very carefully. The hijra. How did he make the hijra? Did he just wake up one morning and get up and say, let me get my camel, Abu Bakr, come on, let's go. And they just headed out for Medina? No. He made plans. He got a guide. He made sure they had enough provisions to take them all the way. He uh, put Ali in his home, left him in his bed when he left. All kinds of plans he made. When you look at the battle of Uhud, as an example, we find the Prophet ﷺ using spies. He had Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, his uncle, who had accepted Islam. But he told him, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ told him not to reveal his Islam to the rest of Quraysh. That he would remain and feed information to them in Medina as to what was going on in Mecca. So he used spies. This is planning. And when Al-Abbas informed him that Uhud was coming, the battle of Uhud, the Quraysh had gathered a big army and they were coming. Then Prophet Muhammad he called the Ansar and 
the muhajirun presented the case to them they started making salah with their weapons with them in the masjid they decided to fight on the battlefield he suggested to them to fight in the city inside of Medina but his companions felt that they wanted to show the enemy that they were uh, warriors that had to be reckoned with better we take tackle them on the battlefield rather than inside of the city this was their decision Prophet ﷺ went along with it and when they went out to look to look at the battlefield he told them he surveyed the circumstance and he said okay see this hill over here called Ainain archers will stay on top of it the rest of the military put your backs to Mount Uhud so nobody can attack you from behind so he set up strategy for the battlefield and he told the archers very clearly even if you see that we are being snatched away by birds do not leave the position of yours until I send for you and even if you see that we have defeated the enemy and crushed them do not leave until I send for you but then again we all know what happened in spite of all that instructions the archers still left the uh, mount of the archers and it caused havoc in that battle but the point is that the Prophet ﷺ planned of course in the case of the battle of Badr his plan was to attack the caravan of Quraysh however he ended up meeting an army from Quraysh so what does that mean it means that though you plan you may not meet what you planned what your goal was may change it may not be the way you planned it however as soon as he found out that he was going to have to fight the Quraysh army then he made plans for the battlefield told his troops to go uh, near the water hole which was in the plain of Badr so they could control the water so the enemy would have to come to them rather than they go to the enemy so strategy planning was there and there was a classic circumstance which happened in the time of the Prophet وسلم, which sums up the principle of planning where a man came into the masjid while Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sitting with his companions teaching them he made his two rakah then he remembered that he had forgotten to tie up his camel outside and the thought came to him should I tie my camel or should I go and sit with Prophet Muhammad and trust in Allah this was the dilemma that he was in of course you and I may not understand the significance of tying the camel here because you have never raised a camel but for people who raise camels they will tell you a camel is not like a horse a horse if you raise it from childhood it attaches itself to you it will go wherever you go it will never leave you on your own it becomes almost like a part of you you're attached whereas in the case of the camel the camel has a different nature the camel if you give him or her a chance to run away they'll run away even though you raised it from being a small camel all the way up till it was big you could ride it you could milk it whatever if you leave that camel for a moment he will run away as if he never saw you before in his life that's just how the camels are it's their nature different so when he had this worry about tying the camel 
It was a serious worry. So what he did was he asked the Prophet ﷺ. He asked him, O Messenger of Allah, should I go outside and tie up my camel, make sure it's tied up, in case I forgot? Or should I trust in Allah and sit down and learn from you? And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Aqilha wa tawakkal. Go tie up the camel and then trust in Allah. So we have the phrase, tying the camel. And oftentimes when I travel with friends in their cars and I see them riding the car without seat belts, I tell them, it is sunnah to wear your seat belt. They ask me, where, where is the sunnah to wear a seat belt? They didn't have cars in the time of Prophet Muhammad I said, Prophet Muhammad said, tie your camel. Tie your camel. That's tying your camel. Of course, people t- wear seat belts and die in crashes. But if it didn't save lives, the governments of those countries that produce the cars would not have forced the car companies to put those belts there. And the car companies would not have put it there with the extra costs that are involved. So obviously, it does have proven benefit. So, none of you should leave this hall tonight and drive your vehicles without your seat belts on. At least that's one takeaway you can take away from the talk tonight. Wearing a seat belt is from the sunnah. Tying the camel. Okay. So, well, what about the verse which said that Allah plans from the heavens and the earth? Well, it doesn't mean that we don't plan simply because he described himself as the planner. He describes himself as Ar-Rahman. The most beneficent. Ar-Rahim, the most merciful. Does that mean that we shouldn't be merciful and beneficent? Of course not. In fact, Prophet Muhammad had said, whoever is not merciful, man la yarham, la yurham, will not receive the mercy of Allah. So wherever Allah's attributes are relevant in our lives, that we have a part to play in them, we're supposed to. Those attributes which are not relevant in our lives, but are unique to Allah alone in its completeness, then we praise Him through those attributes. Like Allah describes Himself as Al-Ilah, the only one who deserves to be worshipped. Well, it's not acceptable for any Muslim to say, oh, I'm going to have some of those attributes too. That people should worship me? No. That becomes shirk. So that attribute is unique to Allah. Allah describes Himself as as samad The one on whom all things depend. We can never have that attribute. We can never. We are dependent on other things. We are not independent. So some attributes of Allah are unique to Him and Him alone. Whereas, many other attributes have relevance in our lives. Like mercy, generosity, kindness, etc., etc. So, planning is good. We should plan. It is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to plan. Okay, so if that's the case... How do you plan? Well, to plan first and foremost, one has to set the goal. If you don't know what the goal is, what are you planning for? Very difficult to plan without having a goal. First thing, we must set the goal. Secondly, then we need to know how to reach that goal. How to reach that goal. What are the things necessary? And 
after we know those things which are necessary, we have to prioritize them, put them in order, first things first. And finally, we have to make sure that we are able to do these things within the proper time frame. Otherwise, it's not ever going to get done. If we leave it open-ended, we cannot implement the plan. So, taking this back to our lives. Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he set the goal for us. Actually, we all know the goal. We were created for paradise. That's why Adam and Eve were in paradise. Each and every one of us has a place which has been designated for us. Just as if we choose not to go to paradise, there is a place designated for us in hell. So we have two places appointed for us. We choose which one we go to. Of course, everybody is going to choose paradise. That is the goal which nobody, no Muslim, would deny. They say, yes, it's our goal. However, we have to look practical in our lives to see, is this goal really reflected? Is it really reflected in our lives? The importance of being focused on this goal is found in a hadith which Prophet Muhammad said, is narrated by Thabit, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, in which the Prophet ﷺ was quoted as saying, he quoted him as saying, Man kanat dunya hamma, farraq Allahu alayhi amra, wa ja'ala faqrahu bayna aynayhi, wa lam ya'tihi min ad dunya illa ma kutibala. Whoever's greatest concern is this world. Allah will scatter his or her affairs, place poverty between their eyes, and nothing will come to them of the things of this world except what Allah had already written for them. Whoever makes this world their goal, instead of making the akhirah, the world to come, makes this world their goal. How can we know? Did we make this world our goal or not? Because, as I said, if everybody is asked, what's the goal? They say paradise. But, if we just stop for a minute and think, today, from the time we got up in the morning, till the time we go to bed at night, Normally, a normal day. What do we talk about with the people around us? The family, neighbors, people at work, friends. What do we talk about? Do we talk about the akhirah? Or do we talk about the dunya? I think if we're honest, we have to admit that most of our conversation is about the dunya. How much money, how big a house, how nice a car, how many kids, vacation. That's what we end up talking about for most of our day. And what does that mean? That means that, in fact, our goal our focus is not the akhirah. Because if you stop and think about anything else, somebody who decides that he or she wants to be a doctor, then when you talk with that person, 
they are always talking about medicine. Some aspect or other about medicine is going to come up in the conversation. Because that's what in their mind they have they want to be. Somebody wants to be a business person in a particular field. You'll hear them talking about it all the time. It is the topic of their conversation. Somebody wants to be a great cricketer. He wants to play in the professional leagues, play for Sri Lanka. This man, you will hear him talking about it all the time. He's got cricket balls in his house. He's got, you know, all the trappings of cricket are around him. It's the main topic of his conversation. That's telling you what is the focus. So, we have to ask ourselves. If our main conversation is about the things of this world, then definitely we are off. We're off the path. We're not really worshipping Allah as we should. And Prophet Muhammad had warned us saying, Taisa Abdul Dirham wa Abdul Dinar. The worshipper of the dirham and the dinar will always be wretched. Dirham could be dollar and the pound, the euro, whatever it's. It's about money. Where it becomes the focus, then we will be wretched. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, Allah will scatter our affairs, meaning that things will never come together. We'll always be running from pillar to post. Here, there, money. We never seem to have enough. We can't get it. And at the same time, we will have poverty between our eyes. No matter how much money we have, we're always thinking we're going to lose some. We even look at people strangely. Normally, if somebody smiles at you, they smile. You smile back. In Islam, smiling is what? Sadaqah. It's charity. It brings happiness in people's hearts. So, we smile. But, for that person who dunya becomes his or her goal, he's gathered a lot of money. When somebody smiles at him, he thinks, what does he want? <laughs> he wants some of my money. He's trying to be friendly because he wants to get at my cash. So what kind of heart? What kind of heart can he have? He cannot have a, a, a heart which is at rest. Can't. And there's a case back in 2009 of a 74 year old German industrialist who had a fortune of 14 billion euros. He was listed as the 47th richest person on the face of the earth. According to Fortune 500, etc. When the crash took place in America, banks, American banks folded, and that crisis hit Europe, in one week, he lost 9 million euros. In one week. You know what he did? He went home, he took out his silver-plated revolver, put it to his head, and blew his brains out. What happened? Did the man lose all of his money? How much did he have left? He started with 14 billion. He lost nine. So how many did he have left? Five billion dollars. Euros. Five billion euros. Do you know how many euros you'd have to spend every day? If you had a life of 80 years, how many... Hundreds of thousands you'd have to spend every day 
to finish it off in 80 years? It is something unimaginable. But for this man, that loss of 9 billion is all that he could see. He couldn't see the 5 billion which he still had. So he killed himself. That is a wretched state. That is ultimate wretchedness in spite of all that wealth. So, as Muslims, we have to catch ourselves and get our focus corrected. Focus on the life to come. Because Prophet Muhammad had said, وَمَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ نِيَةً جَمَعَ اللَّهُ لَهُ أَمْرًا وَجَعَلَ, بين وجعل, آه وجعل غِنَاهُ فِي قَلْبِهِ وَأَتَتْهُ الدُّنْيَا وَهِيَ رَاغِمًا But whoever has the next world as his or her intention, Allah will place his affairs in one. He will gather his affairs and put richness in his or her heart. And the world will come to them submissively. Our affairs will be gathered. Regardless of how much we have, everything will seem to be in place. We don't have a worry running from here, there, worried, thinking, can't even sleep at night because of so much going on in our heads. And Allah will put true richness in our hearts, which is what? Contentment. That our hearts find rest. That thing which no money can buy, which leads people, in spite of their wealth, to kill themselves, to destroy their lives in drugs and corruption, etc., simply because they couldn't find peace of heart. About which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al qulub It is only with the remembrance of Allah, the remembrance of God, that hearts truly find peace and rest. So when we remember Allah, remember the purpose of our life, remember that the akhirah, the life to come, paradise, is really what this life is about, it's a preparation for that, then this world is lowered in our eyes. We don't look at it the same way we look at it now. When we don't have that consciousness, then this world is big. Everything is threatening. We will do haram because we feel there's nothing else that we can do. Or if we want to maintain such and such a salary, then we have to do this haram thing and that haram thing. We won't have the strength of faith to stand our ground and say no. Better I leave this job, take another job with a lower salary, because that one is halal and the other one is haram. So, richness of the heart, the world then falls on its knees before us. We will find that without any major effort, the things of this world will be available to us. That is the promise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, then, we have to determine what is the way to achieve that goal. What is it? The way to achieve paradise. It is none other than Islam. Islam is the way to achieve paradise. So our focus should be on Islam. 
our lives from the time we wake up in the morning till the time we go to bed at night should have Islam interwined, infused in all of the aspects of our lives. Islam should be there, whether we're on the job, whether we're with our family, talking to our neighbors, talking to our friends, on vacation, on a picnic, walking on the beach, whatever. Wherever we are, Islam is there with us. In this way, then, we have brought Islam to the forefront. Islam, which is what is going to take us ultimately to the goal that we seek, that we should be seeking. However, there is one little problem, and that is, which Islam? Sri Lankan Islam? Or Egyptian Islam? Or Malaysian Islam? Or Moroccan Islam? Or Sudanese Islam? Because we have a lot of Islams out there. Islams which are based on tradition and customs. Are they going to be the vehicle to take us to paradise? No, my brothers and sisters, they're not. The only Islam which will take us to paradise is the Islam which was brought by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which was not Sri Lankan, Egyptian, Moroccan, Malaysian, it was pure Islam. The original Islam. The genuine Islam. The real Islam. That is the only one which is going to take us to paradise. So while it's necessary to infuse this Islam in our lives, it has to be that Islam, not the cultural Islam. Because the cultural Islam will confuse us. We really won't know what is right and what is wrong. So it is essential for us to know, to find out what is the real Islam. Because most Muslims today think that Islam is whatever I inherited from my parents. My parents were Muslims, so I'm Muslim. But stop for a minute. Is it possible to inherit Islam? We can inherit a name, family name of our family. We can inherit a culture. We can inherit wealth. We can inherit a variety of things. But can we inherit Islam? Well, that's what they put on our birth certificate when you're born. Parents, when the doctor asks what's the religion, we put Islam. We do that. But writing that Islam on a birth certificate, does that make that child a Muslim? Or is Islam what we said, submission to the will of God, to the will of Allah? This is what Islam is, isn't it? I think we all know that one, right? Submission to the will of Allah. We all agree, that is really Islam. Submission to the will of God. Can you inherit that? I think not. I think you all would agree with me that it is impossible to inherit that. Because submission is an act of the soul, of our individual heart and soul. So you cannot inherit it. Either you did it or you didn't do it. We can go through the motions, and that's what we do. Our parents are Muslim, and they tell us, do this. You say, why? Because you're Muslim. They tell us, don't do that. Why not? Because you're Muslim. So, 
We are told to do things, to say things, to believe things, to accept things, because we are supposed to be Muslim. But you know, Prophet Muhammad had said in Sahih Muslim, that there would be people who would do the deeds of the people of paradise, as it appeared to the public, but they would be from the people of hell. They would fast, they would pray, they would make hajj, they would give zakah, but they would be of the people of hell. Meaning, there will be many people in hell whose names will be Fatima and Muhammad, Ahmed and Khadija, many. That is the reality. But we live as if all Muhammad's Fatimas will go to paradise. So when we name our children, we always give them the name Muhammad in the beginning, then the name we wanted to give them, or Fatima in the beginning, then the name. Which is not from the Sunnah. Which is not from the Sunnah. The Sahaba who were born in Medina did not name or were not named Fatima and Muhammad. This is not from the Sunnah. But people believe it's Barakah. So I'll give you the name Muhammad first, then your name, to make sure, inshallah, you're going to paradise. Because you got Muhammad on there. Or Fatima, make sure you're going to paradise. Because there are not supposed to be any Fatimas and Muhammads in hell. But that is not how it works. It doesn't work that way. And that's why Prophet Muhammad Wasallam had said, Kullu ummati yadkhuluna al-jannah. All of my nation, my ummah, will enter paradise. They say, oh, there it is. Means every Muhammad and Fatima is going to paradise. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't stop there. He went on to say, إِلَّا man aba," Except for the one who refuses. And the companions asked him, Who would refuse, O Messenger of Allah? He said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى Whoever obeys me will enter paradise. And whoever disobeys me has refused. He didn't say, and whoever has Muhammad or Fatima on their name were going to paradise. And who didn't have it have refused. No. He said, whoever obeys me will go to paradise. So it is an act. Obedience is an act. For it to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it had to be an act of the soul. Because if we obey because our parents said, we do because they insisted, we conform because the community pressure, do you think we're rewarded for that? No. We are not. The community will be rewarded for imposing. The parents will be rewarded for insisting. They will get the reward. But we will not get any reward if we have not submitted within ourselves. That is the reality. So, when we determine that true Islam is the only way to paradise. We know that Islam has many parts to it, many aspects to it. We need now to prioritize first things first. The first thing for a Muslim is shahada. The shahada Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. This declaration of faith, the most critical part of it is the first part, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Which is why Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man qala la ilaha illallah 
دخل الجنة. Whoever says لا إله إلا الله, there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, says it sincerely, believing it from his heart, will enter paradise. He or she. That is the promise of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So that is the most important part. Now, if you don't know who Allah is, what does La ilaha illallah mean? Christians say La ilaha illallah. But their understanding of who Allah is, is that He is one of three. Three in one. He became a man, etc., etc. That is their belief. They have the right, if they want to believe that, they can believe it. It's their right. However, from the Islamic perspective, is that, when we say La ilaha illallah, is that acceptable? No way. No way. It means we haven't understood who Allah is. So, when we start with the Shahada, we need to know who is Allah. We need to be clear. And then he says to you, can Allah make a stone which is too heavy for him to lift? And you're scratching your head. Oof. Can he do that? He's able to do all things. So he should be able to make a stone which is too heavy for him to lift. But if he made a stone which was too heavy for him to lift, then it means there's something greater than him. So what is it? If he's not able to make the stone, then he's not able to do all things. Oh. We're scratching our heads. What's the answer? If we don't know the answer, then we really don't know who Allah is. We have a vague idea of Allah. But we really don't know who Allah is. Now I don't want to leave you perplexed. Dr. Bilal dropped a bomb on us and we left here. Everybody's scratching their heads. Look what he did to us. The simple answer is that Allah, when we say Allah is able to do all things, it means all godly things. All things which are befitting for him as God. Not things which will make him no longer God. These are absurdities. It's like asking... Can Allah die? He's able to do all things. Can't he die? Well, no, we said he is ever living. So to know that he's ever living and then ask, can he die? Is ludicrous. It is an illogical and ludicrous question. Because it contradicts who Allah is. So, we need to know who Allah is. Then, the next thing is what? Salah. In terms of the things we have to do, that's what we have to believe. We have to believe in Allah. After that, then we have to establish our connection with Allah. That is Salah. This is prioritizing Salah. And we have to establish Salah as Prophet Muhammad did it. Not as the way that we might be doing it today. We see people around us doing it, every which way, anyhow. You know, when Prophet Muhammad was in the masjid once with the, his companions, a man came in, made two rakah, and came and sat down with the Prophet And he told him what? Go back and pray, because he didn't pray. But he made two rakah. So he went back and he made two more. He came back to the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ said, go back and pray because you didn't pray. <sighs> the man went back again and did two. 
came back, Prophet said, go back and pray, because you didn't pray. Ah, the man said, ah, I don't know any other prayer but that one. Can you please tell me what am I supposed to be doing? So then the Prophet ﷺ told him, when you stand up, you stand up until all of the bones of your back fall into place. And when you bow, you bow until all the bones settle. You pause with each movement. Meaning that all of the actions of salah should be deliberate. We don't start the salah by doing like this. Blockbar. And people when they stand up to pray, Blockbar, they're going straight down into Ruku. So how did he say Fatiha in that? This is, this is the prayer that the Prophet ﷺ said, he didn't pray. She didn't pray. That's not the prayer. It has to be a deliberate prayer. Where we're conscious of what we're doing. And then we also have to be conscious of what we're saying. When we recite Surah Al-Fatiha in the prayer, we should be reflecting on what Allah has obliged us to say. Not just, Hamla Rabbil Alameen. Hamla Rabbil Alameen. What's that? How about Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen? Where we know Alhamd means praise, thanks, all praise and thanks. Lillahi belong to Allah. Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all the worlds, of everything. Where that, those thoughts at least go through our minds. Not Hamla Alameen. Where nothing could go through your mind. What goes through your mind when you say Hamla Alameen? Nothing. They're just words, sounds that we're making. So obviously, those prayers that we make like that, has no value. Prophet Muhammad said, some people pray and nothing of their prayer is recorded for them. Nothing, zero. Why? Because they were hamlerim. That's basic. So, when we talk about prioritizing, that's where we need to focus. And everything else that becomes obligatory, we need to do in the same way. We need to identify our time frame. What is the time frame? The time frame is this life. This short life that we live in. That's the time frame. Once we die, that's it. There's no coming back. Unless we did what we were supposed to do, that we need to do, then there's no way for us to benefit after we pass. So we have a limited time. And none of us knows when the end is, in, is near, when it is coming. We don't know. So therefore, it is essential for us to do what we have to do now. Not put it off until after we make Hajj. You know, for a lot of people, we think about doing things that Islam asks us to do, we think after Hajj. When do we do Hajj? When we can't do any more sins, when we're too old and gray, we can't do any more sins, now it's time we go and make Hajj. You, know? you wonder why so many people die on Hajj. Because huh? <laughs> people are thinking like this. Just the old folks are going to make Hajj. So they're falling on the runway, you know, people are dropping left and right. Because we have this mentality. Whereas, Allah made Hajj obligatory on us as soon as we're able. 
As soon as we have the means, we are able to do it, we're supposed to do it. Not put it off. Some people say, if you have daughters, Hajj is not obligatory on you. So you get your daughters married. What kind of nonsense is this? Who ever heard of that? Who made that rule up? This is nonsense, total nonsense. We're not supposed to be paying any dowry for our daughters anyway. That's not the Islamic way. And because it wasn't the Islamic way, it was really from who? If it wasn't from Allah and the Messenger, who was it from? Shaitan. It's the satanic way. So what is the consequence? People delay Hajj. And end up dying not doing Hajj. Because they were deluded. So, wrapping up the presentation this evening, we know we have to plan. If we don't plan for the hereafter, we will fail to get there. Be sure, brothers and sisters, we will fail. We have to plan for it. We have to make it real in our lives. We have to renew our faith in Allah. We have to practice Islam beginning with Salah. Sincerely from our hearts. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, make your prayers a farewell prayer. Somebody told you, you only have one prayer left and life is over. How would we pray? How deeply would we get into that one last prayer? That's what Prophet ﷺ said. That is the correct prayer. Where each prayer is a farewell prayer. Because when we make that prayer and we leave the place of prayer, is there any guarantee we will have the next prayer? We don't have any guarantee. It could be our farewell prayer. So we need to think of it that way. The Hajj, the fasting, all of our acts of worship, we have to think of it as farewell acts of worship. Where we put that kind of spirit in it, then we can truly plan for the hereafter. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put in our hearts, our wayward hearts, a sincere desire to want to plan for the hereafter. To make the hereafter the most important thing in our lives. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our negligence up until this point we have been deluded by shaitan and our priorities are mixed up upside down the cart is before the horse we're going in the wrong direction when you put the cart before the horse then the horse goes in the opposite direction and the opposite direction is hell that's where we're headed if we don't put the horse before the cart. Put things back in order, prioritize, and follow the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu feekum, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before actually going into the questions, what was mentioned in the introduction and stressed also during the course of the presentation was the importance of knowing Islam. Prophet Muhammad had told us all Talabul Ilmi Farida Allah Kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. So all of which I spoke about tonight can only be achieved with knowledge. We have to have knowledge of Islam. We can't do it based on our customs and traditions. 
we have to seek out that knowledge. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ made it a religious obligation. Alhamdulillah, since 2007, as was mentioned in the introduction, and since 2007, I set up a university online. The Islamic Online University. The website is islamiconlineuniversity.com. You go to Google and put Islamic Online University, it comes up. That university provides diploma courses free of charge, not a single penny or cent or whatever anybody has to pay. It is absolutely free. In order to make the knowledge available to as many people as possible. In the last four years, the student body has gone from zero to 50,000 students studying from 204 countries in the world. You know how many countries there are in the world? 204. We have students in every single country in the world. Because Muslims are everywhere. Free means they're going to join. We like a free package, right? So, it's there for you. Allah, in spite of what the internet is, people call it the fitna net. It is fitna. There is corruption, there is deviation, there is misguidance there. But at the same time, it's also a means of spreading true teachings of Islam on a scale that we never had before. So I encourage each and every one of you to join the Islamic Online University. We also have BA programs for those who wanted to go to Medina and they couldn't get there. They would like to seriously study Islam. We have a BA program there which is costs less to nothing. And for those who can't afford less to nothing, there are scholarships available. We have some 100 scholarships available for those who are poor in Sri Lanka who cannot afford it, even though the price is ridiculously low. I hope that you, inshallah, you will take advantage of this opportunity on your way out. There will be some brochures given to you on the Islamic Online University, and you will join up and take a benefit. Okay. So question first, a Muslim's planning should be based on Quran and Sunnah. Is it right? Yes. How do we stop extravagance? Well, we stop it by knowing extravagance when it exists in our lives. If we don't know it, then we can't stop it. So we have to know what constitutes extravagance? Extravagance involves spending unduly, spending excessively on things we don't really need and we don't really use. It doesn't mean simply buying an expensive so and so. You bought a BMW instead of a Toyota Corolla. Is that extravagance? No. If you buy, if you can afford that BMW, you bought it and you use it, then it's not extravagance. But if you bought 10 Toyota Corollas, you just left them around the house, you didn't use them, you only use one, or you drive one every day, that's extravagance. So it's not how much you spend, but what you do with what you spend. And also, whether you could really afford it. Because... Maybe you went and bought that BMW because your neighbor got a BMW. And you really couldn't afford it, so you had to go and take out a loan. That is extravagance. You're living beyond your means. And of course, this was not the way of Rasulullah and his companions. Question, Muslim men in Sri Lanka expect their wives and daughters to be like Aisha as far as the women's dress code is concerned. Yet they tend to dress like every Tom, Dick and Harry. 
no beard whatsoever and so on. What's your opinion? Well, <laughs> if we want Aisha, then we need to be Abu Bakr. <laughs> Does Islam encourage family planning? No, it doesn't. But is it permissible? Yes, it is. As long as we don't do anything which is permanent. I fear when I don't ask Allah for cars, houses, etc. Will Allah not give them to us all? Because the scholars say, لَيْسَ insani illa ma sa'a. Yes. Human beings will only get what they strive for. So, shouldn't I ask Allah for cars, etc.? Yeah. If you need a car, you don't have one, ask Him for it. It's okay. We can ask Allah for the things of this life. We say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adabina. So we have both sides and we should turn to Allah. But we should be guided by Allah, by Islam, by the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The reaction from society, why are you living simple like this? This is not the way to live. Well, that's ignorance. Don't worry about society. Remember, if we please Allah and displease society, we have succeeded. If we please society and displease Allah, we have failed. If we can please society and please Allah, alhamdulillah. But oftentimes it's not possible. A lot of people do not pray witr. Is it mandatory or can we stay without doing it? It is not mandatory. Prophet Muhammad was asked, is witr wajib? And he said, no. But tahajjud, is the best prayer after the Fard prayers. And if we want the best for ourselves, then we should try to do what is best. Okay, Barakallah Fikum, I'd like to thank you all for listening and sharing with me this evening. And I hope that some of what was said was of benefit to you. I'll leave the organizers now to close down our evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.